Hi, and welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith, and in this video, we're going to learn the one to six player game, Castle Panic, designed by Justin DeWitt and published by Fireside Games, who helped sponsor this video. Castle Bravehold is under attack from a horde of goblins, orcs, and trolls pouring out of the surrounding forests, and as its defenders, you'll have to defeat every last one of them before they tear down the walls and destroy the castle. Based on the original classic, this is the second edition, which you can get in the version I have here, or in boxes with upgraded wooden or plastic pieces. Not only that, there are four different ways to play the game inside this box. We're going to learn the cooperative mode fully, but also briefly discuss the other three modes at the end of this video. So, join me at the table, and let's learn how to play. To set up, put the game board in the center of the play area. Understanding its layout will help with the setup and gameplay, so let's take a quick tour. The board is divided into a series of rings labeled as the Forest, Archer, Knight, Swordsman, and in the center we have this Castle Ring. The board is further divided into three segments by color. Blue here, red here, and green here. You can also think of the board like a large pie cut into numbered slices known as arcs. So here we have arc 1, arc 2, arc 3, all the way around to arc 6. Ultimately, this creates a variety of spaces around the board. For example, this is the blue archer space that is in arc 6. And over here we have the green knight space in arc 3. So with that understood, let's move on to the rest of the setup. For your very first game, you'll need to add a plastic stand to each of the wall and tower pieces like I've done here. Then inside the castle area, add a tower piece to each of its spaces, creating a circle of them so it looks like this. You then add a wall piece to each line showing between the castle and swordsman ring like I've also done here. Nearby, also put these fortify and tar tokens and the die. The tokens with this shape are known as the monsters, and from these collect three goblins, two orcs, and one troll. In any order you like, add one of these monsters face up into each archer space of the board. As you do this, be sure to rotate them so the highest valued number on each monster's corners is pointing towards the castle like this. The value on a monster currently pointing at the castle represents that monster's current health, which can be affected over the course of the game, as we'll see. Now flip all the rest of the monster tokens face down and give them a good mix. You can leave them in a pile, or as I've decided to do in this video, they can be stacked. Now find these order of play cards and give one to each person to use as a reference while playing, but also notice you'll find the same helpful reminders here on the game board as well. Next, shuffle the castle cards, which have this back, into a face down pile and deal a number of them to each player based on this table found in the rule book. In this video, we'll assume we have two players, so we deal six to each person. Since this mode is fully cooperative, players should leave their cards face up in front of themselves for everyone to see. And that's the setup. In Castle Panic, monsters will be pouring from the forest around the castle, advancing on it to smash down its walls and destroy its towers. As players, you must work together to defeat all of the monster tiles before they knock down all of the tower pieces in the center. If at least one tower piece remains after all the monsters have been dealt with, the players win. The game is played over a series of turns, starting with the player chosen randomly and then going clockwise around and around the table. And on your turn, you'll perform six steps. You'll find a reminder of these printed on your player aid, and let's go through each of them starting with the draw up step. Here, you'll draw cards from the deck until you have a full hand, which in a two player game is six. Since we're on the first turn, our hand is already full, so we draw nothing. However, this won't always be the case, so you'll find yourself using this step more frequently in later turns. That was easy, so on to step two, discard and draw one card. Here, you can pick any one card you have and discard it into a face-up shared discard pile beside the main deck. Then after, you draw a replacement. This is an optional step. You don't have to discard and then draw a new card if you don't want to. Either way, we now move on to step three, trading cards. This is also an optional step. You don't have to trade if you don't want to. 
but discuss this with the other players. And if a trade seems like a good idea, then the current player picks one other person to trade with. If they agree to trade, you'll each choose a card to exchange. And this is important. You have to give them one card and they must give you back one card. You can't just give or just take a card. It must be an exchange. Perhaps as players, we decide that I could benefit from having this blue hero. If this player agrees, I might give them my red knight as a trade for it. As this table in the rule book shows, if you have a game with six players, the current player can actually trade up to two cards during this step, both with the same player or making a single card trade with up to two different players. Again, trading is an optional step, but either way, we move on to the play card step of your turn. Here, the current player can play as many of their cards as they wish to, as long as the cards they play can be resolved. As we'll see, many cards require having a target, so you can't play a card if it doesn't target something. And just know, to help explain how the cards are resolved, I'm going to add and move monsters around on the board to create some useful examples. This is the blue archer, and as it indicates here, you can play this to hit monsters. But as it describes in this effect area, it will only hit a monster in the blue archer ring. Looking at the board, that means it can only target a monster that is in either of these two spaces. So we could play this card to hit either of these two monsters. Let's target this orc. Anytime you hit a monster, unless the card says otherwise, you deal it one point of damage, rotating it so its value pointing towards the castle is reduced by one. You then add your played card to the shared discard pile. In a similar way, you'll find cards that target other colors and other rings. For example, this red knight can hit any monster in a red knight space for one damage, while this green swordsman only targets monsters in the green swordsman spaces. This is a blue hero, which is limited to attacking monsters in blue spaces, but it can hit them in either the archer, knight, or swordsman ring. So we could use it to target any monsters in those related blue spaces. Just note, monsters in the forest ring can never be hit. Now in this case, let's use the card to hit this orc again, dealing it one damage. When a monster is hit when it's already on its one point value, it is slain and put into a face-up monster discard pile beside the board. These are known as the Any Color Swordsman, Any Color Knight, and Any Color Archer, which will hit one monster of any color anywhere within their related ring. For example, this Any Color Swordsman could target a monster in any of these swordsman spaces. With that, you now know how to interpret all of the hit cards you'll find in the deck. But now let's examine the ones with this special keyword at the bottom. When played, resolve the effect shown on their bottom and then add them to the discard pile. And how these work is described on the cards themselves, but let's look at a few in closer detail. For example, to use Nice Shot, you play it with any other hit card you have and then slay the monster you targeted with it. This means instead of having to hit this troll three times to defeat it, we can play these two cards together and slay it immediately. This fortify wall effect adds one of these tokens to any wall of the castle, but at most, each wall can only have one token at a time. We'll see how fortifying a wall helps you later, and we'll also go over a few more of the special cards, but some of those will make more sense once we've learned a few more of the rules. For now, just know you can play as many cards from your hand as you like, as long as they have valid targets. When you're done playing cards, it's time to move monsters. Here, all of the remaining monsters on the board move one space directly towards the castle without leaving the numbered arc they're currently in. And again, I'm going to add some extra monsters to the board just to provide you with a few other examples. If a monster would move from the swordsman ring to the castle, but a wall is blocking its path, it attacks the wall, removing it. But the monster also suffers one point of damage, so rotate it as normal, but if it wasn't slain by this, it stays in the swordsman space. If a monster advances on a wall with a fortify token, it still takes one damage as normal, but you remove the token instead of the wall itself. The next time the monster would advance, it will take a point of damage, but also destroys the wall. 
All monster movement is considered to happen simultaneously. So if two or more monsters are next to a wall when they would try to move, they attack the wall together and destroy it. However, you pick just one of them to suffer the point of damage. Any monsters that still remain will stay in the swordsman's space. On a later turn, if you have a monster move from the swordsman's space and there's no wall in front of it, it enters the castle ring. If there's a tower in that space, just like a wall, you remove it and then the monster suffers one point of damage. As long as it has points remaining, it will then stay inside of that tower space. The next time a monster inside the castle moves, it instead advances clockwise into the adjacent castle space, destroying any tower there and taking a point of damage. Also notice, once the monster is inside the tower ring, walls do not affect it. So the wall here does not stop this monster from advancing. If you have two or more monsters in the same space advancing into a tower, only one of them takes the point of damage. The rest are unharmed and all surviving monsters move together into the new space, stacking them to fit there. If all of the towers in the castle are ever destroyed, the players immediately lose. So you really don't want the monsters to get into the castle walls because as we saw, none of your hit cards target monsters in the castle ring. However, let's go back and look at some of the other special cards that can help out if you use them during your play cards phase. This barbarian allows you to slay one monster anywhere, even inside the castle, but still not in the forest. When a card lets you target a monster in the castle, it will show this castle symbol here. With Drive Him Back, you pick any monster on the board and send it all the way back to the forest space of its arc. Notice, this shows the castle symbol, so it's another one of the few cards that can target a monster in that ring. If you do target a monster in the castle, as it's sent back to the forest, any wall or fortified token it would move through are ignored, and the monster doesn't take any damage. Another trick up your sleeve is the tar effect, and you'll notice this can target a monster in the castle ring, but also in a forest space as shown by this symbol. After picking your target, add this tar token to it, and now nothing can move that monster for the rest of your turn. At the beginning of the next player's turn, you'll take this token from it, freeing it up to be moved again in the future. With that, we now know how to resolve the move monster step of your turn, and we've also learned about some cards you can play during the play card step to slow them down. Now we'll go on to the final step of a turn, drawing two new monsters. Here you take two tokens from the monster pile, keeping them face down. Then reveal one and resolve its effects fully before revealing and resolving the next one. So let's go through each of the different types of tokens you'll find here and see how they're resolved. If you reveal either a goblin, orc, or troll, roll this die and then add the related monster to the forest space matching the number rolled. So if I had revealed this orc from the monster pile, I would then roll the die, and if I got a five, I would place it here in the five forest space. When a new monster is added to the board, also ensure that its highest value is pointing towards the castle. And also keep in mind, there's no limit to how many monsters can end up in the same space. There are also four boss monster tokens you may draw, which each have special effects that resolve when they're revealed. And you'll find these detailed on the corner of the board if you need a reminder, and on this page of the rulebook if you have any questions when playing. After resolving their special effects, each boss monster then behaves like a regular monster for the rest of the game. Several tiles in the monster pile have this border and are known as monster effects. When drawn, you resolve the token and then immediately discard it from the game face up. So let's go through each of these and see how they work. If any of these are drawn, and let's say for a moment we drew this one, you then move all the monsters one space that are currently in the related colored spaces. These tokens cause all monsters to move either one space clockwise or counterclockwise within the ring they're currently in. So if this token was resolving, we'd move this goblin to the right. These plague tokens each refer to a type of card you may have in your hand, which all players must then immediately discard. For example, if we drew plague knights, each player discards all cards they're holding with knight in their title. This monster effect requires all players to choose and discard one card from their hand. Any player who doesn't have any cards just ignores this effect. 
If you reveal either of these tokens, you must draw an extra three or four monster tokens from the face down piles, which you'll resolve after all other tokens are resolved that you might have already drawn. For example, let's say I was beginning the draw two monster step of my turn, and I took these two tokens. The first one I flip tells me to draw three monster tokens. I now draw these, and I would set them below the other ones I'd previously drawn. Then, after resolving this, I'll continue to the next token, and after this is resolved, I'll then continue to resolve all of these as well. Just keep in mind, if you ever need to draw more monster tokens than are available in the face down pile, draw as many as you can, and ignore any you can't. The last type of tile you may draw is a giant boulder, and after revealing this, you roll the die. Then, starting in the forest of the matching value, roll the boulder towards the castle, staying within that numbered arc. And once it starts rolling, you do not stop until it hits the first castle piece in its path. And it will slay any monsters in the spaces it moves through, including in that forest. So in this case, both these monsters would be immediately discarded from the game. As soon as the boulder hits a castle piece, you remove it along with the boulder. For example, if it hit this wall, then the wall would be destroyed. Now, if the wall had had a fortify token, then instead of removing the wall, you remove the token. If there had been no wall here when the boulder came rolling through, it would enter and destroy the tower piece instead. On the other hand, if there was no wall or tower in the arc the boulder had rolled down, it would continue into the opposite arc and destroy the first castle piece there. A tower first, or if there was no tower, it would hit the wall. If there were no castle pieces in the boulder's path at all, then it will just keep rolling all the way to the opposite forest, destroying all monsters along that arc too. Once it reaches that other forest, you then remove that token. So the boulder can be dangerous for your castle, but it can also help you wipe out some monsters. And those are all the types of tokens you might reveal during this final step of your turn. Then, with your turn over, the next player in clockwise order takes their turn. And with that, we now know enough of the rules to cover the last few cards you might play during your play card step that I've been waiting until now to show you. When you play Missing, it causes you to skip the draw two monsters step and just move right on to the next player's turn. This brings us to the last two cards we need to go over, and these are labeled in their bottom left-hand corners as resources. Neither of them do anything on their own, but if you play a brick and mortar together, it allows you to build one wall. You can only do this while at least one of the castle's walls are destroyed, and then, when played together, you take a wall that was destroyed earlier and add it to any empty wall space on the board. Just keep in mind, brick and mortar can only build walls. Nothing can repair a tower that's been destroyed. And with that, we've fully covered all the things you can do on your turn, and turns will continue around and around the table with each person following the order of play until the game ends in one of two possible ways. If the last tower is destroyed, no matter how many walls are remaining, the players all lose. On the other hand, if at least one tower is still standing, and all of the monster tokens in the game have been played, in other words, if all of the monster piles are empty, and all of the monsters on the board have been slain, the players all win. That said, the cooperative mode is just one way to play the game. If you want something more competitive, there's also a master slayer mode, where the players are still working together to fight the monsters, but each player will earn points for the monsters that they each slay, and the player with the most points at the end of the game is declared the winner. There's also an overlord version where one person takes on the role of an overlord who controls the monsters, with all the other players fighting against them. The game also comes with rules for solitaire play, as explained here. There are even optional rules that allow you to adjust the difficulty if you want less or more of a challenge, along with variations for the overlord mode of play. And, as you can see here, there are a variety of expansions that can be picked up separately to add even more challenges to your Castle Panic experience. But all of that I'll leave for you to discover on your own. Otherwise, that's everything you need to know to play Castle Panic. If you have any questions at all about anything you saw here, feel free to put them in the comments below and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. 
You'll also find forums for discussion, pictures, other videos, and lots more over on the games page at Board Game Geek, and I'll put a link to that in the description below. And if you found this video helpful, please consider giving it a like, subscribing, and clicking that little bell icon so you get notification anytime we post a new video. And if you'd like to support us directly, you can join our Patreon team, which I'll have linked below. But until next time, thanks for watching.